When I began to achieve the level of celebrity <laughs> for vertical farming, which there were two of us at that point, Gene Giacomelli and myself, I began to be asked to uh, give talks at various places throughout the world, actually. And it was really one of the highlights of my career. I, I had a career as a medical parasitologist teaching at a medical school. And all of a sudden, I'm thrown into this world about which I know almost nothing, except that I do like to eat. Following up on that and looking at uh, medicine from the opposite view of the microscopic, now we can look at the macroscopic. I became very, very interested in knowing everything I could learn about where our food comes from and why it isn't coming from the places where it should be coming from and why it sits and languishes at a warehouse and why perhaps it loses its nutritional value on the way over to my plate and all kinds of other wonderments. Why is there a bug in my soup? <laughs> that sort of thing. Following the publication of the book, but actually before that as well, I had a chance to talk with a lot of people who are interested in starting up vertical farms because they'd heard about the idea and they had actually talked with me perhaps. And I had lunch with a lot of different people. And obviously, uh, one of the people I had lunch with was the guy who now owns Bowery Farms and reminds me constantly of that lunch. And I wish I could remember what I had. <laughs> he, he told me it was buffalo wings. Well, that's, that sounds right. I, I probably would have involved <laughs> some aspect of buffalo wings into my meal. <laughs> I, I believe it was a, a pub around the corner from Columbia, if I remember correctly. Yeah, it was Coogan's Restaurant, in fact. And it was... Uh, that was my second office, and I used to invite people there for lunch a lot. The idea that this should be a commercial venture, though, in the beginning, of course, and even in the middle part of the idea, in the early 2000s, none of us had any inkling of what the future held for that idea. And it's remarkable to see how many people were willing to put their money where my mouth was. And that's what I guess we should be talking about, because it really all boils down to the fact that it had the feeling of a perfect storm. I hate to use that cliche, but I did. And it's very appropriate at this point because climate change issues, food failures, food riots, weather pattern changes, immigration to various places that doesn't have a food supply, all of those things fall together to alert the world that food is a pretty critical thing. Food rules. You mentioned natural disaster, and we're all thinking about climate change right now. We're seeing the very real time impacts of it. In my research of the piece that I'm working on, I looked at Japan, and Japan has, I think, north of 200 vertical farms at this point. The largest one, or the largest several, being from a company called Spread. I read an interview with the CEO of Spread, and he essentially said that it was near impossible to get to profitability. It was very hard to scale. And that the tipping point for them was the Fukushima disaster, was the tsunami. A large amount of that section of Japan's farmland was completely wiped out by this nuclear disaster. Now, obviously, we're hoping that it doesn't take a nuclear disaster for something like that to really accelerate here. It does seem like climate change can be a major motivator. Japan was primed for that. I mean, they had people working on this idea for 10 years already. And they had all the data that they needed to say how to do it. What they didn't have is exactly what you said. They didn't have the financial backing and the permission from the government to actually go ahead and institute vertical farming. And besides the Fukushima meltdown, I watched that tidal wave sweep over those barriers and wipe out in one hour 5% of Japan's farmland near the town of Sendai. That was remarkable. When you can witness something like that and realize that an entire country, 5% less productive, in an hour, it really brings home the idea about where does farming occur and, and why does it only occur where land is? It's not the only way to grow food. So that, I think, really was the uh, stimulus for other countries like Singapore, for instance, and Holland and England, even France, the foodophile of all foodophiles. To consider growing food in another way is really remarkable. The countries like Denmark and Holland are leading the way, as you well know. In addition to our country as well, we're, we're making great progress with regards to lighting, the kinds of foods that you can grow indoors. Profitability level is a remarkable subject in itself because when you consider any other animal on this planet besides us, that is never a consideration for whether they feed their young or not. Can they afford to feed those baby cubs? Or do they just go out and kill a moose? The answer is very simple. Food is primal. For people, it's an economic commodity. And yeah. it, it really is sad to see that happening. 
It's funny to hear you be surprised that what's leading all of the vertical farming are these startups, are these companies, are these sort of capitalistic concerns. I mean, you know, reading the book and having spoken with you, it seemed like your hope, at least at the time, was that this would be more of a civic push. Well, it will be. <laughs> but I think everything has to start somewhere. And so mm. the fact that we're talking to each other over computers 20 years ago, that wouldn't have been happening. Certainly 10 years ago, only the people with uh, deep pockets could probably afford this kind of a communication system. And today we're teaching all of our classes via remote Zoom. Once you realize what we can do now, in another 10 years, we will having a much different conversation. I think the food varieties will be different. The companies will be different. The ownerships might be communal rather than uh, individuals or corporates. And we can get to that subject because I have a, why is vertical farming not the only subject worth talking about nowadays? And the answer is because half of us now live in cities. But if you look at cities from the perspective of, is it a good place or a bad place to live? Is it where you would choose to live? Is it where you would like to raise your family and your children? A lot of people would answer no to that question. They're stuck because that's where they were born, especially if you travel to less developed countries where hyper-urbanization is the reality uh, that they're going to be faced with for the rest of their lives. It really forces people to live at a different level, a subsistence level, a day-to-day -day level. So why isn't vertical farming playing a role in alleviating some of that stress? And so that's my actual next book. It's called The New City. And the reason why is that I had to find a role for vertical farming in the urban environment. And it's not just about economics, and it's not just about using old warehouses, and it's not just about pleasing mayors of cities and, that are run down and that need revitalization. It's about feeding half of the world, basically, that chooses or has to live in a city. How do we do that? And if we could do that, what would that mean for the rest of the world? And I think that's what drives us back to climate yeah. change issues. I know, obviously, China has been very proactive about this. They've got drought and famine issues, and obviously this tremendously large population that continues to grow. I will say that I am slightly pessimistic when it comes to the involvement of government, just from the standpoint of, you know, I'm looking at this infrastructure bill right now and something that is seemingly as simple as, you know, paying for a COVID response or like fixing the freeways and the bridges has just been this incredibly difficult, drawn out process. But do you see a future wherein uh, the government can take a more involved and proactive approach in helping realize your vision? Yes. In fact, I did mention that in the original version of my uh, Vertical Farm book, too. But it was probably glossed over a lot because that's near the end of the book and you can get tired of reading about this subject <laughs> after a while, right? Yeah. But the government has played a huge role in uh, biomedical research. Let's just take another example. First, the war on cancer. That was a Nixon and a uh, Johnson program. Got off the ground. And it has never stopped. The amount of money fed into cancer research has been tremendous. It has fostered hundreds of thousands of careers. It's uh, allowed infrastructure to grow in terms of pharmaceuticals, this mRNA vaccine, for instance, for COVID. Uh, none of that would have been possible without this kind of support. So if you want to now go back and then look at what the government is doing for agriculture, they have a farm bill. And the farm bill comes out maybe every four years or so. And half of that farm bill is to pay for food stamps. And the food stamps are to allow people who can't afford food to buy food that the farmers are going to grow and harvest, no matter whether they buy that food or not. Farmers are driven to produce as much as they can. And sometimes it's in their favor and sometimes it's not. And of course, there is this soil bank program which they pay farmers not to grow things, but that's a little sketchy every now and then it works, but most of the time it doesn't. So the point is if you've got all this food, and you've got half of the people, or let's say a quarter of the people who can't afford it, the government steps in and says, okay, we'll help you afford it by giving you food stamps, and then you can now support farming. Well, what are you going to do for the people living in the cities? I mean, I know city people have food stamps also, but the government really could back off and say, you know what, we really should be putting our money into we should, education, and education at what levels? Maybe the ag schools. Every state has at least one state ag school. It has an IT school. We know some famous ones like Caltech and MIT and UC Berkeley and UC Davis and University of Pennsylvania. A lot of these places are in existence because the government has a program that supports them through federal grants. So why don't we have a Department of Urban Agriculture in the Department of Agronomy, an ag school, let's say a good ag school? I think the government should start to encourage ag schools 
to develop urban agriculture departments by offering large bundles of money to set up those departments and to perhaps even establish a, an experimental vertical farm on the campus so that the students could use that as their laboratory or to then use the four years or so that it would take them to get a graduate degree in learning how to grow all these cash crops that we claim are too expensive to grow and therefore they're not profitable. Well, okay, Jones, you go in there and make uh, corn profitable, or let's mm. let's raise some wheat, or let's raise some radishes, or I, I want carrots to be profitable. I want all those diverse crops to emerge onto the fresh food market. And this is maybe one way to get that to happen. And having spoken with a number of people, have mentioned things like corn, rice, wheat, soybeans, these cassava crops. This, the consensus is that you know these are cases where they're just so efficient being grown outdoors that it's going to be a very long timeline before uh, indoor farming is competitive with them. That's one take on that. But if you look at um, who's growing the corn and where they're growing the corn, every year is different. We have large commercial firms like Monsanto and Ar uh, Archer Daniel Midlands and uh, Cargill that have bought up failed farms from corn and soybean farmers. And those farms are held in reserve. So when the climate is right, for that particular farm in that particular year, you'll get a high yield, but that doesn't happen every year. Cargill doesn't care because they're so diversified in their farming that wherever the weather is good, they're going to have some farms that will be productive. So little farmers can't do that. Big farming can do that. And then, of course, you know that they're not making food with those products that they're producing. They're doing value-added products like high fructose corn syrup and things of that sort. So I think that outdoor farming, ultimately, if we believe that climate change is real and it's not a belief system, so just remember it's all based on science, which is not a belief system, it will eventually prohibit a lot of the agriculture that you currently see. And, and a good point in making that is the local storm that California just suffered from yesterday. Wait till you see the aftermath of that. You won't believe what happened. There are places yeah. that got two feet of rain in 24 hours. There goes whatever topsoil was there, it's gone. And that's what that means. And it's gone where? It went out in the ocean. It's a tragedy. You can't recover that. So if that continues in these patterns of extremes, then you're going to have to change your model for raising even crops that are not profitable now, but people want it. Okay. Government will step in and subsidize those crops because that's what they do for other crops anyway. And first, they do it a lot for commercial growers. And, you know, what is that all about? When we know what that's about. I don't want business as usual. And I'm not against business as usual as long as it's productive and as long as it serves a purpose. But if it just puts money in a few people's pockets, then that's really not the way most of us see the world. I suppose the role that these companies can play early on is, is a proof of concept. I mean, I would assume that pragmatically before the government is going to invest billions or trillions in this technology, it needs to be proven out to some degree. This is all true. And so um, if you're curious about how popular an idea this is right now, just go to your computer and type out on Google vertical and farm and see how many hits you get. I did that about 10 minutes before we went on the air here, and I got 960 million hits. Mm. That's a couple shy of a billion hits. I mean, you only get 6 billion hits for Google. <laughs> so it, it means that everybody's now looking at this. And they're more than curious as to what the uh, ramifications are. There is global chaos with regards to other patterns, and that's attendant with rapid climate change. If you want to ignore that, that's fine. But they're having a big conference in Glasgow this week. The president is putting aside his campaign for this budget thing. He's going to go. Of course he's going to go. Now, look who didn't go. Yeah. Uh, Putin's not going. The Chinese president is not going. This is a, a tragedy in the making because those people will take advantage of short-term gains for long-term trouble. I hate to continually be the pessimist in this conversation, but aside from these budgetary concerns, you know, I think it's difficult to have this conversation when a significant portion of the population and, and certainly a significant number of politicians in this country don't believe that climate change is man-made. Like I said, it's not a belief system. You can look for yourself. I mean, I've made many trips out west to go trout fishing. Sometimes I go through Alberta, and there's a, a glacier there, which is called the Columbia Glacier, that feeds five different river systems throughout the world. And one goes into the Atlantic, one goes into the Pacific, one goes into the Arctic. And that glacier has signposts saying in 1999, the glacier was here. And then you have to walk another 100 yards, 
in, in, in 2010, the glacier, you know, was here. And then you keep going back in time. Basically, most glaciers are all in retreat. That's the strongest evidence we have of just visual evidence that the, the Earth is changing. And it's changing rapidly, not just uh, gradually. And that affects everything, it, not just farming. It affects where people can live. It affects sea level. All of that is related. And nature adapts. And if we're nature, we'll adapt. And I think one of the adaptations we have for, as a choice is to grow our food indoors. Imagine if we did, let's say just half of what we farm right now is grown indoors, all right? So that means we're only going to feed people living in the city with vertical farms. People living outside in a rural settings, they can grow their own food. That's what they choose to do, and that's what they do, and that's fine. What would it mean, then, if half of the land that's used to farm now was to be put back into natural process, as, let's say, David Attenborough would like to see, or E.O. Wilson would like to see? What happens if half of the world's ecosystems suddenly get a break, and they say, you know what, we're not going to touch you anymore. We don't want to stick this stick down that hole and see what comes out. We're going to allow you to grow back to what you used to be. And we'll see, because we don't need you anymore. What we really need is food, and we've got it now. So go ahead, live it up. And I can tell you right now that the CO2 levels in the atmosphere would decrease, the temperature of the earth would regulate, the RCC would become just CC. Everybody's life would get better. Having spoken with Irvin Fain, the CEO of Bowery, one of the things that we talked about was the, the lunch that the two of you had with, again, I believe, buffalo wings. And, and he said... I think every industry needs a North Star at some point. I think Dixon has been a phenomenal North Star for the industry in some ways long before everybody was on board and believing in indoor farming. Do I think that everything that he imagines will come to pass? Not necessarily, but that's not the goal of the North Star anyway. This idea of sort of being a, a North Star, perhaps being, I guess, a little sort of more focused on the macro, you know, less pragmatic day to day about that. Do you think that that was your role in writing this book? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I wasn't a, attempting to be a North Star. I'm flattered and honored to, to have been called that. That's the only one that doesn't move. I don't know. I mean, I, I wrote the book from my experience in the classroom and from the attitude of all my students that also expressed equal amounts of enthusiasm. And that's how the idea actually came out of a rooftop gardening situation into the abandoned buildings and then newly designed vertical farms and and finally, well, what would be wrong with having as many as you could fit into a city? And then finally, my view has now shifted even more so to why shouldn't every building have some form of vertical farming associated with it? What's wrong with that? And the answer is nothing. Everybody who lives in that building or works in that building has to eat. Unless it's a warehouse or a sporting arena or something like that or a school, even a school, that would be perfect. What would be wrong with that? And the answer is, as long as there's somebody there to take care of it, there's nothing wrong with that. So that's a new industry, isn't it? What if every building did have some farming capacity? You could have a core of 10 or 20,000, maybe even 40,000 people working in a large city that did nothing else but just take care of those farms, ensuring that under quality control, the food is fresh, it's safe, it's available. Uh, that's the goal. I mean, to, to turn a city into a productive unit of a life form that right now is parasitic on the landscape. We want this city to become a mutualistic symbiont. It's a fancy term for it helps the countryside survive by not taking advantage of it. It can make it on its own. Like today, for instance, where I am, it's raining. Every building out there should have a rain harvesting system built into the roof system. And they should have a storage system. And they should use that water for heating and cooling as well as for bathing and drinking and even part of the vertical farm. All of that, what a terrible waste that is. You go to the USGS website and they said, on average, on most cities, it rains so much that you could water up that whole city for half a year on, on the amount of rain that falls on it on an annual basis. You and I are both in the New York area, but certainly something to be thinking about for our West Coast friends who are currently yeah. having the first rain in forever. Exactly, exactly, exactly. And, and you, you can find cities that are already on board for this. I mean, Mexico City has a regulation now. Every new building has to have rain harvesting capacity, every single one. And in 50 years, they probably will replace 80% of their buildings with new buildings that have this capacity. And so you can say that for a lot of other things, too. And, and if you start to add all that together, um, you end up with a very interesting comparison because you want a building that, A, carbon sequesters, that harvests rainwater, that grows food, 
and that can generate energy. And the energy can be uh, generated through clear photovoltaics. You might have heard of them, but a lot mm-hmm. of other people might not have. And you can turn a window into a photovoltaic cell by just coating it with a special liquid. Of course, you have to rim it with some metals to, to catch the electrons. But I sequester carbon, I harvest rainwater, I generate food, and I make energy. And the little kids, well, I know, I know. What are you? I'm a tree. Exactly. You're a tree. So why can't a building imitate the functions of a tree? And the answer is it can. Now, obviously, power consumption is the big question in all of this. And the majority of the farms that I've either seen or visited have been these large windowless structures. You know, Bowery's are located in these fulfillment centers. So they just don't they don't have natural lighting. And therefore, you're cutting these farms off from the Earth's largest free energy source. Looking at sort of some of the images in the book and some of these ideas, that doesn't strike me as the way that you would have gone about this initially. Well, it depends on where I am. I mean, we have to qualify this all the way, because if I lived in Iceland or if I lived in South, like Italy or the South American Southwest, where there's a lot of geothermal energy, then I'm not concerned at all about energy at all. In fact, I, I would love to use geothermal energy to drive these vertical farms. You only have to invest once. Geothermal, is once you hit that hot zone and you can tap into that, the rest is all maintenance-free, basically. American Institute of Architecture in New York City has a 1,500-foot hole in the ground that they use to power up their entire facility with, and they don't have any electric bills. They had to just to pay for the hole and to the, to the mechanism for capturing the heat. But once you do that, you're golden. So I can point to another farm in Copenhagen right now that's being built. It will be the world's largest vertical farm, but everyone says that as soon as they make one. And the government of of Denmark is allowing them to tap into their national energy grid, which is all wind power, and there's no charge. They said, we have excess wind, we have excess power, we have very, very poor storage facilities. So a lot of this power is going to waste. Here, come and have some for yourself. And that's happening in a lot of places, okay? So if you go to a place like Las Vegas, can you believe Las Vegas is off the fossil fuel energy grid? Mm. That's unbelievable. One of the vertical farms actually moved there because of the low energy costs per kilowatt hour. It's Mm. 8.4 cents per kilowatt hour in in Las Vegas. I think what you're getting at here is that the environmental motive and the the profit motive don't necessarily need to be at odds with one another. Uh, That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And eventually they can come together. I mean, I think geothermal is a great example. You dig a hole, a very deep hole, but you can do that. I mean, we have machines that will do that. You just have to be able to afford the initial cost. There should be a loan program, 10-year payback with the bills that you're going to save for your electric bills. You should be able to pay these things off in a reasonable amount of time to allow them to come into being. Now, I live in New Jersey, and they have a huge program with regards to solar power. That's because their current PSE and G facilities can't supply enough electricity for the growth of the industries for the, and the growth of the state population. So any new houses that are built are encouraged to install solar panels on their roofs. And then Jersey has a, a big uh, incentive program to allow them to do that. So that's, that's how these things often work out. And eventually it ends up solution to a problem that didn't even exist before. As somebody who has been at the forefront of this, are you seeing actual interest from the U.S. government specifically when it comes to vertical farming? Yeah. In fact, the United States Department of Agriculture has had five or six regional meetings already on that subject. I was a participant in two of those in Washington, D.C. Very high level people were at that meeting and you were allowed to speak your mind. You could say whatever you wanted, poo-poo the idea, or you could tout it way beyond its potential. We had both of those sides of the story being spoken at the same time almost. You could now find on the website for the USDA a section devoted to indoor farming. And that was never there before. So now what's going to happen is the USDA is going to set the standards for food safety for indoor growing, because that's their job. The food safety is a big issue. The Department of Agriculture oversees the safety of your food, basically. More and more food is being grown indoors, and it's hyper fresh, and it's hyper safe, and it's it's free of all these um, contaminants that you might pick up in soil. But at the same time, it, it has to be regulated, and you have to put a seal on it, just like you do for the other certified items. They want to get involved now because they realize that they're late in getting started. 
because it was an idea whose time had come and gone for them. And now they're playing catch up. With the benefit of 10 years of hindsight, is there anything that, that you look at in terms of sort of the predictions or the eyes, ideas that you have that are were kind of wildly off? <laughs> yeah. Well, one of them was that I had a good picture of me sort of kneeling down on the road with my, I had my camera and I took a picture of the Apple uh, store on 59th Street mm-hmm. and uh, Central Park West. And it's the it's big, totally, the big glass structure. It's a cube. It's a, it's a yeah. glass cube, basically. And I thought this is the way the vertical farm is going to look. It just mm-hmm. has to look this way. And it's just the opposite. It's just what you want to do is to keep out sunlight because it contains wavelengths of light that actually inhibit plant growth. And who knew that until you started to use LED lights that you could tune and then you could see the red and the blue, a little bit of green, and you throw that together and you leave out all the other visible spectra and you've now made it much more efficient and the plants grow twice as fast. So uh, yeah, I was way off base. But like I said, I'm a microbiologist. That was an intuition on my part that was totally wrong. The, the biggest one, though, was to see it succeed. I mean, I had no idea that this would happen. We're talking about the 10th anniversary of the book. Let's do some wild speculation here, which, you know, I, I know you like to, to some degree. What might a 20th anniversary of the book look like? Well, it'll be written by somebody else, probably. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm 81 years old. That's going to yeah. be a great part. <laughs> Okay, but let's assume that I'm still alive and I'll write my 20th anniversary. Well, my hope is that by that time, Cross-laminated timber will be the official building material for any building. That's carbon. That's pure carbon. That's trees. You just make something else out of them. But And in that building will be all of the things that I've just described, energy production, food production, and water harvesting, so that you've got a replacement program going on inside the built environment, which makes connecting those buildings together into networks of sharing units equal and, and possible. And now you've got buildings that can't grow enough food to feed the people that live in there because of the configuration of the building, sharing the amount of energy that they generate because they don't need as much with a building that makes more food than it can eat with that building. And then it's got water connections underneath the ground to a central reservoir, sort of takes the city off the uh, natural landscape grid and makes it an autonomous center. That's the best thing that could happen to a city Mm -hmm. over the next 20 years is that it could develop into an independent provider both sustainable in the long term. Building materials are renewable. They can be reused, repurposed. Concrete and steel, very, very difficult. Glass, very difficult. These buildings are gorgeous to live in. It's like stepping inside of a yacht when you go home. Imagine living in that working condition. You'd run to work if you could go to a building like that and sit and, you know, just think. That's my dream. And my dream is that there's no homelessness because everybody has a job. Everybody's put to work doing something, uh, no matter how menial or trivial. And nothing is trivial in a city like that. Everything matters. So everybody's a worker bee and everybody is a, a leisure couch potato at various times during the day or the week or the month, whatever. It sounds ideal. It's probably not. It's, uh, there's a lot that can go wrong with a system like that. We have to learn how to live in cities. We just don't know how to do it. We know how to build them. We know how to look at them. We know how to visit them. But living inside of a city is a, still a challenge. And it's, they've been around for about... 6,000 years, we've had a lot of time to work this out, and we haven't really gone anywhere with it. And I think the reason for that is because mostly it's about commerce. A big city is about commerce. And the, the, the most important regions of a city are commercial regions. They're not people regions. And for that reason, cities exclude people-friendly modes of transportation, even uh, commuting from your house to the job. Nobody does that anymore anyway, so it doesn't matter. And I think people's lives will be longer and healthier and yeah. happier. You know, that sounds very Pollyannish coming from somebody who I haven't had a difficult life. I, I'm an academic. I mean, I was paid to think. And this is, this is what happened. And I'd <laughs> like people to know that. I mean, really, given enough time just to sit and think, these ideas will occur to everybody. It depends on who was the first one to say it. And I'm I'm lucky enough to be the mouthpiece for 110 graduate students over 10 years. And that's, that's this book's essence is that these are condensations of whole conversations that we had in class that generated the thought that led to the next idea. And we need more of that. We need, we need a lot more of that. 